Don't think that you pray once and then that suffices. Well, I, I told God, if you think praying once is enough, then you haven't read the prayers of the patriarchs because they kept praying and some of them prayed over and over and over again. We are in the fourth chapter <laughs> of the book of Colossians, message number 63. And uh, somebody said, you know, there, there's 90 some verses in, in the book. And I said, yeah. And I'm not, I'm not trying to count the messages anymore. We're just numbering them as we go. So whatever that, as long as I think we'll be OK, as long as we don't get to verse 95 and I'm on message 210. <laughs> Never mind. I want to focus on three words in our text, and then I want to go away from the text, a little bit like a, a next verse, if you will. So the fourth chapter, I'm jumping over uh, the first verse because I feel it kind of ties in with its uh, companion verse in 22. And we're starting with continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. And the only three words I want to focus on right now are continue in prayer. There are a couple of Hebrew words. I know I've, I'm just leaping off the pages of Colossians. There are a couple of Hebrew words that convey prayer. Um, I would probably say about a dozen uh, in terms of the nomenclature of prayer, um, but there are probably only about three that are heavily used. Um, the first one is the word palal, to meditate, pray, intervene, judge. The word is used four times in the intensive verbal form, and the remaining 80 times, so 84 times, the remaining 80 times are found in the reflexive or reciprocal form in which the action generally points back to the subject. Reciprocal or uh, reflexive, I, I do for myself, I pray for myself, uh, or reciprocal, that is praying for one another, which could fall under the category of intercessory prayer. Um, there is another word, tzela, which is the sense of bowing to pray, and the third word, most common, sha'el, to ask, inquire, or consult. The first thing, let me take you to the first place I want us to look, because it kind of gives you a, an indicator of something. If you turn to Genesis 4, and yeah, when I go back, I go way back, right? Uh, Genesis 4 and verse 26. This is after the fall. This is after the Cain and Abel episode. And in verse 26, it says, And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called the name of his son Enos, or Enosh. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Now there's much, uh, there's a lot of polarization within the commentator's community on how this should be understood. That then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Even Zodiades himself, if you have a Bible like mine, uh, has a number to it. Then, then began men to call, says to call themselves by the name of the Lord. That's his interpretation. And people are not exactly clear on how this should be understood, but it really doesn't matter. The, the, the concept that is being conveyed is that it was at this point that the creation began to turn back and look to its maker, whether that is by desire to emulate or by desire to strive to be closer to, it doesn't matter. This is basically the book of Genesis. This is the book of beginnings. This shows us the beginning of when this um, would have occurred early on. But if you remember, uh, and you've got several chapters that deal with this, Man has already fallen. Man has already lost his ability to have straight communion with God. So prayer actually becomes much more important to the fallen man than to the unfallen man. Adam, in his perfect state, had perfect communion with God. So think about that. There wasn't a need for prayer. It was straight conversation. Can you imagine? Just kind of think about this for a minute. We read this book, and I don't... For me, actually, sometimes I have to kind of shake my head that when we desire to talk with God, we open our mouths, we pray. Most of us, I'm going to say most of us who are honest probably don't hear anything 
back from him. But can you imagine in the day and age that these patriarchs lived, that they spoke, and they could audibly hear God speaking back to them? I don't know if that would be a joy or freak out, like, where is it coming from? But I, I, I sometimes think we don't even get that creative when we read to really think what it must have been like to hear the voice of God with clarity, not, not ambiguously, not vaguely, not faintly, but with clarity. That must have been quite something. Now, if you turn with me to Genesis 12, because I'm going to start to show you things that happen that are connected to prayer, a place that becomes dedicated and marked out. Genesis 12, and if you read in verse 8, um, here, beginning in this chapter, the Lord has already begun talking to Abram. And in verse 8, it says, And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, that's Abram, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. So it's interesting that you have this kind of a place now that will be associated with God. And this will happen multiple times. And again, in 13, there's another, again, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. So it just reinforces places that were marked, that were either revisited, but they were important. Um, there's also spe specificity when he prays. Remember that God promised him a child and actually said he was going to change his name, right? His, his name was going to go to High Father, to Father of Many. Uh, when he prays and he says, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? Now, we read that in the King James, and it's very verbose, but let me put it to you this way, because it would probably sound more like this. God, you haven't given me a child, and the guy that's the steward in my house, born in my house, is not of my seed. You can't get any more direct talking to God than that, all right? We have this tendency that we want to we wanna kind of either make this more spiritual or we have to stretch out the words and, oh, heavenly Father. And it's like, really? God's probably going, really? You're freaking annoying me. <laughs> you know, just spit it out already, right? So, um, or he says it again, by the way, two times where he basically says, behold, thou hast given me no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. So how can your promise be good of saying you're going to give me one when you haven't given me one? God, what do you intend to do about this? Now, some of us might actually <laughs> recoil back with that type of talk towards God and say, y you think that's okay? But I want to tell you something. I think it's more than okay seeing as God spoke directly to these people and doesn't seem to be offended. And where he is, it says God's anger <laughs> was kindled or whatever. It's, it spells it out. I think God wants our, not only our trust, but our complete directness when we come to him. And I think a lot of times we try to, it's like trying to find the right words and we f kind of fumble around instead of just be direct. Now we know that this prayer, the two laments I just said, his prayers of specificity, God, you know, I have no seed in my house, See that I, I go childless. Basically, what are you going to do for me? And that, that prayer, we know, is answered by the birth of Isaac. So it's almost like we do ourselves a great favor to isolate each and every one of these prayers in the Bible and then look where the answer occurs. Sometimes the answer comes quickly. God promises something, and then you see it comes, and it comes quickly. And other times... The promise was given to Abraham. How many times have I said this to you and told him he was going to have many children? But how long did he have to wait for God to make good on that promise? And I think I said one time it was over 25 years. So whatever that time frame is, or just under 25 years, whatever that time frame is, don't think that you pray once and then that suffices. Well, I, I told God, if you think praying once is enough, then you haven't read the prayers of the patriarchs because they kept praying and some of them prayed over and over 
and over again. Sometimes Abraham prayed for guidance, and other times, as we know by his actions, he just did things on his own. So it's kind of interesting. See, I relate to a lot of these people in the Bible, and this is the way I kind of put myself in there. I actually relate to Abraham, sometimes listening and sometimes just doing his own thing and doing his own thing. He went down into Egypt and went where he wasn't supposed to go. And then other times God says, and do this, and yes, sir, right? So I find great comfort even in the prayers. Um, one time God is, uh, Abraham's asking God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? He's speaking of the land. And he says, how am I going to know this thing? I want you to think about any time that you have asked God for something. And please tell me that you've somewhere in your mind asked the question, how will I know when God has... Imagine you're praying for something that you can't actually put your hands on. The question should be, if you're like Abraham, how will I know when God has actually made good? And this can, this can stem into many aspects of our life, but sometimes when we pray, that's the thing. We're impatient, we pray once, and then it's like, oh, God's not doing anything, so forget about this. Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba, and there called upon the name of the Lord, everlasting God. It's almost like now, marking a place becomes synonymous with the promise of God saying, this is what you'll inherit. And we know that God makes good, obviously. You've got to go hundreds of years later to see when Joshua enters into the promised land. God gave a promise back there and said, for, for the petition of a prayer, this is what I'll do. You've got to go hundreds of years later to see that promise and that prayer being made good on. So we can also see the influence Abraham had on his servant and eventually his son. Now let me pause here for a minute because there are some lessons from Colossians I want to bring in here. We know that um, Abraham sends out to find a wife for his son. And it is, it's, it is Abraham's servant that prays, and I believe it's in Genesis 24. But remember in Colossians we were talking about masters and servants, and I talked a little bit about the family life. This is what I'm talking about when I say if a father, the, the father figure, how God kind of set up the family, if that example as a template is being followed, then it really is more about people seeing what is being done and basically doing likewise. Why? Because the servant, Abraham's servant, prays a prayer here, which is an awfully really good prayer. And then we see Isaac praying. So it really is kind of what you see is what you'll end up doing. Children see their parents doing things. They imitate them. Everything that happens in the home, we can kind of go back to say there is a genesis to something. Here we can see the servant. Listen to the servant's prayer. That's in verse 12. O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall, she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby I shall know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. Now, you read on the rest of the chapter. That's his prayer. That's what he's praying for. Because he sent out on a mission to get a wife for Isaac. Now, verse 15, it came to pass before he had done speaking that, behold, Rebekah came out who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Naor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. And the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin, virgin, neither had any man known her. She went down to the well, filled her pitcher, came up. The servant ran to meet her and said, let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. She said, drink, my lord. And she, she, she hasted, let the pitcher down upon her hand, gave him to drink. 
And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. She hasted, emptied her pitcher in the trough, ran again unto the well to draw water, drew for his camels. And the man wondering at her held his peace to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. You think? Because, I mean, right there, he says, and if this, and if that, what are you waiting for? Should, she, should, should you have said, and if she has one blue eye and one green eye, and she has one silver earring in her, her left ear and a, and a unicorn horn on her head, then I'll know. That's sometimes how we pray, too. You know that? Sometimes we do the stupidest things. We open our mouth, we say a thing, and then we, we have to ruin it by adding things that, honestly, God said, I heard you the first time, and I heard enough of what you said. Just make sure you don't forget what you were asking me for. Think about all of this. So we know his prayer, if you read on to the rest of the story, we know that his prayer has basically been answered because obviously the answer is Rebecca is the one, okay? And then even more interesting is that once she is brought to Isaac, Isaac prays for her because she is barren. And I love the fact that you don't need to go too much further a few verses later, and it says that God opened up her womb and she conceived. Now, listen, there's all these factors. There's the line of promise that has to be continued with God's choice and the seed that must descend to Christ. There's God's promise to Abraham that must be made good on. There's all these different things that have to happen. And in all of this, a prayer of a servant specifically is answered. The prayer of now the husband, Isaac, to the wife, Rebecca, is answered because she was barren. Now she will have a child. And to even add to that, we're told about how she has two children in her womb, basically struggling and fighting amongst themselves before they even come out the gate. So how good is God to give us the word spoken from Abraham. And how will I know? And how will I know I'll inherit this thing? And God, how, how can this be when I don't even have a child in my house? And you see the prayers being answered each time. And that's why I said it is good for us to study these examples and see that they're not all the same, that they can sometimes give us insight and hear me very carefully into the lack in our prayer. See, I think a lot of times, somebody might say, well, you know, I've heard this, and this, this one drives me crazy. When prayers aren't answered, people say, oh, you, then you, you don't have enough faith. You have unconfessed sin in your life. Can you shut up? <laughs> Just because you prayed. You know, what I love about the Bible is there are unanswered prayers in this book. God is not Johnny on the spot each time somebody opens their mouth like a Pez dispenser right there, okay, you got it. It doesn't work that way. There are sometimes the things that sometimes we ask for that are not according to God's will, and they're not according to God's purpose for us, and God will not answer those prayers. And other times, we are right in what I'd call the lane, looking unto him, our eyes are focused in the right place, and we ask, and there can still be, by the way, a no. Everything has a purpose. And I don't want to say God will say no because and give the reason. Only he knows what that reason is. Maybe it's to keep us praying more. Maybe it's to keep us humbly praying more. I don't know. I, can't, I cannot tell you. That's for God to answer at some point. Uh, you keep going. In Genesis 26, you read about another place again dedicated uh, in Genesis 26 and 25. Uh, where now it is Isaac. Uh, he built an altar there, called upon the name of the Lord, pitched his tent there, and Isaac's servants digged a well. So I would say to you, each time there is a place of dedication, there's usually an altar. The altar is for sacrifice and offering up prayers. So prayers and sacrifice mark that spot, which again, I'm just trying to show you, was an integral part of everyday life, not just I'm going to say it colloquially, not just when your butt's in the slinger, okay? Because that's a lot of times we, we tend to think like that. It's the foxhole prayers, right? Or we're, we're going to be in that moment, but n not at any other time. 
So maybe this will give us some idea. Now I'll give you the one to me that really spells uh, you're praying because you know that there's impending doom. This one is Jacob's prayer in Genesis 32. Now remember, Jacob knows he's going to meet his brother Esau, and all he can think of is Esau is going to come for him. This is it. And if you remember, he splits his family and all of his possessions into two groups. He sends gifts towards Esau, but splits up his family and possessions into two groups and makes them pass over ahead of him. And here in Genesis 32 and verse 9, Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, Lord, the Lord which saidest unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all thy mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands, speaking of how he's divided. Now here's his prayer. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother. Put a period right there for, for the sake of this prayer. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother. Why is it we can't get this through our head? Now, I'm going to do something that I know will make people mad, but I'm going to specifically speak to my Catholic audience because we have a lot of Catholic listeners and you who have been trained to recite prayers and to write prayers on cards or read off of cards. God is wanting the prayer that's written on your heart, not something somebody else prayed for you to recite. Yes, there's a template. I know people like to pray, for example, in the New Testament, very confusing. People like to pray. They call it the Lord's Prayer, which is not the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. It's actually the disciples' prayer. Jesus could not pray that prayer because he had no sin, didn't need forgiveness. He didn't need to confess his sin. But what I'm saying to you is it is very important for us to understand that these type of prayers that just come out of the heart this is what gets God's attention. They are prayers of sincerity. They are prayers of honesty. Now, I'm not saying somebody reading off of a card is dishonest. I'm saying that God wants to hear from your heart, not the heart of somebody else. So while you can pray, for example, the disciples' prayer as a template, understand what you're actually praying for in that prayer. And Jesus didn't say, this is the definitive prayer guide. When they came to him and said, teach us to pray, he said, when ye pray, you pray like this, and starts off with our Father who art in heaven, recognizing the Father, recognizing it's the Father that gives us all possession that we have, and also recognizing that if we are not at peace with our fellow man, we cannot be at peace with God. That's basically that prayer in a nutshell. Do you really think that most people are actually taking the guts of that prayer and making it a reality, or are they just reciting it? Sit, don't answer, because I can tell you if people are actually reading and praying the guts of that prayer and not the words on paper, we'd have a lot more Christians in the body of Christ who are God-dependent, God-fearing, and God-understanding. And that's just not the case. I hate to tell you that, but that's just not the case. Now, in the case of Jacob, we know that Jacob is the heel catcher, he's the conniver, he's the deceiver. But just listen to the honesty of his words. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. Next time something is headed your way, it's that direct of a prayer. Lord, get me out of this mess. Lord, save me from this. You know, even now that I'm, I'm just talking about this, even the disciples had the sense, Lord, save us, we perish. Lord, save me, I'm drowning. There's, n there's no need for a lot of this verboseness that people seem to think makes it sound more spiritual. So, what else can we, what else can we know? Well, we know this. His prayer, by the way, deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother Esau. We know that if you read the whole thing, Esau receives the gifts they basically meet, and the meeting is such that nothing happens and both go their separate ways. So if you want to say, and I would tend to say it this way, God did indeed deliver Jacob from the hand of Esau. Esau could have 
the whole scenario could have played out differently. Esau could have come at him and, here, you know, he's got his club and his stones. Okay, brother. No, that didn't happen that way. So I'd say to you, look for answers. Don't only analyze the prayer, but look for the answers. And then you begin to see this is very faith building because every promise that I have looked at thus far, God has answered. We move into the book of Exodus, and I might as well just kind of spin us forward here. In the second chapter, verse 23, and it came to pass uh, in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of their bondage. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them, or knew them. So what's interesting here is for the first time we have basically something of a national prayer. It is a simultaneous groaning of the people for a singular cause with a singular mindset. Now, you know, I always have motives underneath everything here. So let me just share a little bit with you because we can learn from, as I said, looking and analyzing at a lot of these prayers. We can learn a lot. And the one thing I can tell you that's totally obvious to me. I um, happened to be watching, there was a, a rerun on TV of the movie Apollo 13, and there's a part of the movie where they're up in space, and everybody is praying. They have, uh, they cut away to, you know, it's a news reporter saying all of America's praying, and you see people praying, and you see people actually, kids in school with their hands clasped, and people are actually praying for safe return for the astronauts. What, what the hell happened to this country, really? Now we're like, if, that, if, it, if we took that event now, we'd probably have people saying, well, that's racist that, that they're in space. <laughs> Don't pray for them. Don't pray for them. Oh, listen, I, yeah, trust me. I, well, I'll put, I'll put a lid on that one, but if we, we, we have really not progressed at all, okay? So I want you to just take notice that because this is the, the first one that I'm highlighting, but there will be many of these what I would call national prayers, where it's a body of people crying out together. And I think we, in this particular age right now, could take from that as a body of people that need to come together with one mind, one spirit, and one accord to start praying for our country. I mean, I have been saying this. Our country is not in a good place. All of our politicians, I don't care what you like, if you are uh, identifying as a red or a blue person, I don't care if you identify as a green, orange, or yellow person, and I'm talking about your political affiliation, it's all messed up. All of it's messed up. There isn't anything that's working for you. I don't care who you voted for, who you like, no one's working for you anymore. Don't deceive yourself. No one cares about the American people. The only people that are being cared for are the people who are entering this country illegally. Those are the people being cared for. Now, with that being said, and I just spoke a very important truth, it's time for us as Americans, and I don't care if you're a Jew, a Muslim, or a Christian, to start praying for this nation again, as it's, this is the only way we will actually get back to normalcy. Now, I don't know. It's kind of like that expression, the spilt milk, you can't put it back in the bottle. Well, get me a sponge and a broom. I'm going to try, OK? <laughs> so you have this national prayer, if you will, a, a group of people. If you go to Genesis, I'm sorry, Exodus 5, uh, I label this one as a doubting prayer. Kind of interesting. Uh, verses 22 and 23 of the fifth chapter of Exodus. Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? What is the purpose of you sending me before Pharaoh? What is the purpose of you sending me on this mission? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people, neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. Now, this one has me feeling like maybe Moses should have taken a little cover while he was talking to God, okay? Because that's kind of like, you know, uh, God, I think you're you know, a little nuts there. But why I label this a doubting prayer, because he's saying, like, are you going to do anything at all, God? Now, 
I want to show you how much we're all alike. Haven't you ever prayed and asked God, are you going to do anything? Why are you letting this still go on? That's exactly what Moses is saying back to God. Even though God commissioned him, God raised him up to do this very job, to go and deliver the people. But see, Moses doesn't have, it's not all wound up. Moses doesn't have the crystal ball to see everything God's going to do. So he says, are you going to do anything or not? And this whole time, this is basically Pharaoh keeps egging us on, and you're not doing anything. I confess I've prayed like that to God several times. I'm not proud of it, but that's what I'm saying to you. If we're going to identify with the Bible, it really behooves us to look at some of these people that prayed and see we're not rude. It's not blasphemous when you speak to God directly and when you're praying for things. Even Moses, who clearly knew God had at least raised him up for this moment and is still basically doubting, even though he's, he's putting it back to God, he's still doubting. So there's something to be said for that. Um, and then again, in the sixth chapter and the twelfth verse, Moses spake before the Lord, saying, Behold, the children of Israel have not hearkened unto me. How then shall Pharaoh hear me? Uh, who am I of uncircumcised lips? You know, they're not going to listen to me. Pharaoh's not going to listen. God, why do you even bother sending me? Now, this is more, you might say, it doesn't really sound like a prayer, but it is. It's a prayer of lament, and it's a prayer of petition. It's also a prayer of complaint. And um, I'll tell you the, the study that many years ago I remember reading from uh, Brueggemann on lament and praise in the Bible kind of opened my eyes to this. You have to peel back a little bit to see, you know, we, we read these people and we don't really maybe put flesh and blood on them. You know, can you imagine the frustration of Moses? He already doesn't want to go and be the mouthpiece and kind of angers God by saying, I don't even know how to speak. And God says, oh, I'll fix this and I'll, I'll work it out for you. Now he says, that, you know, you're sending me and you know, who's going to listen to me? I think probably stepping back and looking at the big picture, everything that Moses asked God, I think we would have been doing the same thing and maybe more so. So again, this might be a good study for someone to do if you're really interested in, in these type of things, is to isolate every single prayer of one individual. Uh, if you're looking at Moses or David or, or Job, pick one individual and analyze their prayers. Look for their prayers, analyze them. Also look for the answers. The answers they received are not always the answers that they were praying for. And this helps us to understand how God deals with us when we pray, what we're asking for. Um, so, again, in chapter 8, if you want to turn there, uh, Moses is crying unto the Lord because basically the frogs that God brought against Pharaoh. And then it says, the Lord did according to the words of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses and out of the villages. That was the prayer basically, of Moses to not, to not let this thing, you know, can you imagine frogs raining down and he's thinking, you know, don't let this happen, like imagine dead frogs in your house. This is why even the smallest thing about this prayer that Moses prays is actually a prayer of intercession by Moses for the people. And he does a lot of that. So it's like in studying his prayers, you can get an idea of what these prayers were and how God answered them. You know, God didn't just say, okay, now I'm removing the frogs, but the frogs died outside the houses. That was the crucial thing. All right. Uh, in Exodus 14, we have another kind of national outcry, if you will. And that is, if you read down in Exodus 14, beginning at verse 10, when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. Now, they were, they were crying out unto the Lord, probably help or save. We don't have what they were saying. But, and then they said unto Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? But that's their lament to Moses. But if you read carefully, the Egyptians are basically pursuing them, 
and the children of Israel cry out unto the Lord. Now, this will be a repeated theme of the children of Israel crying out unto the Lord as a body, as a group of people. And I can't say this enough. If we really understand what this means, this should inspire us to know that maybe we need to roll up our sleeves and start praying a little bit more. Maybe it's not just on an individual scale, but more on a national scale. It depends on what God puts in your heart, right? Um, but if you read on into, verse, uh, into chapters 15 and so forth, you see that obviously the prayers were answered. Why? Because we know that God closes up the water, the Egyptians drown, and God says, okay, now what were you saying when you were busy crying out to me about what's behind you, right? Prayer answered. So this is what I'm saying to you. It might not look like it because it's a simple phrase. In Israel, the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. But each time you find that, that is representing the prayers of the people as a body cumulatively. God, help us. And God obviously did. So I'm highlighting as many things in different ways as I can. In Exodus 17, we have here, this is the passage that deals with God instructing Moses to smite the rock so that water should come out of it, that they would have water to drink. And beginning at verse 5, the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, take with thee the elders of Israel and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb. Thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come out of the water, there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now this is in response, by the way, to the grumblings of the children of Israel and to Moses' prayer. So this, I'm reading now, a response, not the prayer of God acting for what they were asking for. And you can keep going. I mean, the whole... Bible is replete with, you know, you have over and over and over again. I'll take you to one or two more because I think I'm driving home the point because this is a study you can do on your own and it is, I believe, very profitable, especially for those people who are wanting to see and understand more, a deeper level of understanding. In Exodus 32 and verse 32, Moses says, yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin. So this is prayer of intercession, a prayer of forgiveness. But then read the second part of it. And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. So God, if you're not going to listen to my prayer for the people and forgive them for what they did, then blot me out. That's quite a prayer, especially if you know the one who you're praying to has the power to blot you out. I mean, I don't think that Moses just said that like uh, uh, for thrill and shock value. I think he knew that God was capable of blotting him out. And I also know that I think God's, from God's perspective, the very act of intercession on behalf of the people. We know that here the Lord said unto Moses, whoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. And this is in direct reference, by the way, to them building the golden calf. Who led the charge to build that golden calf? Aaron. So you kind of just think about everything that's here. Then ask yourself the question, does God act on it? Well, read verse 35. It says, the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. So it's as if God is saying, yeah, I make good on my word, and I also make good on when I'm hearing the people's prayers, but I also make good on what I said I would do. And he says here that he'd punish the people, those that sinned against him. So in combination between the plague that was put on them and ultimately God getting pissed off and strewing their bones in the wilderness, which he did, there's only a handful that entered into that land. Um, one more out of Exodus, and that is in this 33rd chapter and verse 14, and this is where really this one gets my attention big time. It's a prayer for God's presence, for God to be with them. And he said, my presence shall go with thee. Basically, Moses said, if you go not, if you don't come with us, Lord, I'm not going. 
So I want you to think about that. All of these particular prayers, could, you can just lift up and you could say, yeah, I, I want that. Put in your own words then. Don't copy Moses. Don't plagiarize his words. Take them to yourself. God, I need you with me today. I need you with me every day. You figure out how, how to put the words that come out of your mouth, but they come from the heart, not somebody else's. This is why when I tell people, uh, especially as I said, people who get caught up in uh, sects of Christianity, that are determined to practice practices that actually contradict the Bible because they don't study or read the Bible. They just think saying that I'm a Christian and reciting a few prayers and uh, crossing oneself suffices, and it does not. So uh, I'm going to just keep beating on this until everybody understands what I'm saying. Numbers. Come on. We're skipping over the book of Leviticus, so you know there's only two left in the Pentateuch, Numbers and Deuteronomy, so you know I can't have that much more to read. <laughs> ah! <laughs> All right. Chapter 11. When the people complained, it displeased the Lord. The Lord heard it. Now remember, it says here just a complaint, but I still put this in the form of God hears every word you and I utter. Because this was a complaint. It doesn't say they prayed. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. The Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And I don't blame him one bit. The people cried unto Moses, and when, when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. That's quite a prayer that one man, just a human being, can pray and pray to the Lord, and the fire is put out. And he called the name of that place Tabera. And if you look in your margin, it says a burning, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never had this happen. Moses prayed unto the Lord, and the fire, the fire was quenched. Stop the fire. Boom, the fire stopped. Have you ever had a prayer like where you prayed that, and God entered in that quickly? I haven't, but obviously he can. I'd like to see that one. You know, I'd like to pray one time and pray specifically for something to happen right then and there, right in front of my eyes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we have clarity about this. Uh, we'll say that's an instant response. Then there's another one. Uh, just one more chapter ahead in chapter 12. This one is Moses basically crying out to God to heal Miriam. And we know that Miriam was punished by God. She came out and basically, you know, hey, Moses, you think you're the only one who can talk to God? Her, her snootiness, her attitude, everything else. And so basically God puts leprosy on her. Uh, and you can read clearly, it says, you know, in verse 13, Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. And the Lord said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? So that, would, that would have been kind of something for seven days as a practice in that day and age. Let her be shut out of her own camp seven days, and after let her be received in it again. Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days, and the people journeyed not until Miriam was brought in again. And you get the idea. But here... Obviously, we know that God healed her, um, but his, Moses' prayer, heal her now. Three words. Now, the next time somebody says, pray for me, I want you to remember these simple and direct things. They are not convoluted. They're not all drawn out. Blah, blah. Just very simple. Somebody says, I need you to pray for me. We know where two or three are gathered in his name. He's in our midst, so I understand the reason for the two or three coming together and asking. And if they ask anything in my name, but now I'm just saying to you, have a little bit of clarity on how people are praying and how they're asking. There's another one, by the way, number 16, uh, which happens just after Korah's rebellion. Well, it's in that time frame. And um, we have a prayer that basically kind of spells out uh, 
we'll call it, as I said, like a national prayer. But the interesting thing is that each, in each of these cases, uh, regardless of the events, we have usually Moses leading the prayer. So you have somebody who's kind of leading with guidance. In this day and age, let's say for us, yes, we can have spiritual leaders lead or give direction for prayer, but more importantly, we have something that wasn't given in this day and age in the Old Testament, and that's the Spirit helping us. So we have a help when we need to pray. We don't have to kind of try and figure out what to do. The Spirit helps us to pray. So you can kind of see what I'm trying to show you here is that you have different types of prayers, national prayers, prayers for punishment, prayers for justice, prayers that are doubtful, prayers that are more trusting, prayers that are more like a promise. But each one of these has something in it that we can glean, take to ourselves. For example, in Numbers 21, you've got the story of the brazen serpent amidst the fiery serpents. There, if you read that passage, you're going to find intercessory prayer for the people. Moses speaking to God and basically interceding for them. So Moses basically, in his praying, look where his prayers are, look how God answers them. And they're not always met with the answer that you think. And this, this is helpful for us because sometimes we pray and we think there's only one answer. This is the only way God can answer when, in fact, I think it's more like a Rubik's Cube. God can answer it this way, and he can answer it this way, because he's God and we're not. He can see all of the different movements, or like a chess game, he can see the moves before they happen. We can't. So think of it that way. Um, I have a few more, but they're in Deuteronomy, so I want to take you there, and then you can tell I'm kind of close to being done. All right, Deuteronomy 9, and it's kind of hard to find the right place to start. So we'll start at about verse 24, which doesn't really give clarity, but um, verse 24, Deuteronomy 9, you have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. Thus I fell down before the Lord 40 days and 40 nights as I fell down at the first because the Lord had, the Lord had said he would destroy you. I prayed therefore unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, destroy not thy people and thine inheritance which thou hast redeemed through thy greatness which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Remember thy servants, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Look not unto the stubbornness of this people, nor to their wickedness, nor to their sin, lest the land whence thou broughtest us out say, because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land which he promised them, and because he hated them, that's pretty powerful, <laughs> because he hated them, he brought them out to slay them in the wilderness. Yet they are the, thy people and thine inheritance, which thou broughtest out of thy mighty, by thy mighty power and by thy stretched out arm. Now there's a prayer for you. Destroy not the people. And I think this is really important because I think, uh, let me reduce this down on a scale that's, more understandable for all of us of how we might view this prayer. You know, right now there's a lot of tension between, just between Americans, and there's a lot of hate out there. There's a lot of haters hating like never before. So let me ask you a question. The, the prayer that is being prayed here, God, destroy not thy people and thine inheritance which thou hast redeemed through thy greatness, the same people you brought out of Egypt's bondage, all that stuff that you did in the past, this is kind of like a prayer that says, remember all the ways the Lord thy God hath led thee. It's very similar to that. So what I'm saying to you is we need to turn back to being a praying people and praying really with specifics. This is why I'm doing this exercise. I really see the need. I also see the need to study um, some of the, these prayers, the type of prayers, how, how they were prayed, how long did it take for God to answer? When did God answer? Under what circumstances did God answer? When God answered, does it say God was angry? Was God pleased with this? These are all the things that I'm analyzing when I look at this, and I come to one place to recognize something. Uh, this is why the book of Deuteronomy closes with the saying that says, there, there arose not a prophet in Israel like Moses. Moses was one of his kind, and basically there won't be another of its kind until... Deuteronomy spells out another prophet, which is pointing to Christ. But 
The important thing that I'm saying here is that if we're not clear about this, and I'm, I'm going to highlight Moses for a minute because I just kind of closed the message with him. To analyze, here wasn't a person who was depicted as a great spiritual person for the first part of his life. And I think that sums up a lot of us. So we can still learn, we can still glean from, from the life of Moses, from the life of all of the patriarchs, actually, uh, on how to better pray and how to better understand that the answer is not always yes. Um, I have much more to say on this, but I can say this to you. Um, God's grace, I sum these up in bullet point thoughts, God's grace makes prayer bold. If you have received God's grace and you know you've received God's grace, it gives you more and greater boldness to pray because you know that you've received grace from God. Two, God's justice makes prayer trustworthy. In other words, God is not going to let you have the short end of the stick. It may appear so in the moment, but when God says he will make all things the way he sees them, right or just in his eyes, you may think in the moment justice has not been served, but when God enters in, he will do it his way, and it will be. God's purposes make prayer a must. Why? Because if you look at his purpose for us humans, it requires communication. You cannot have a communicationless relationship with God. It's a must. When we struggle in prayer, God gives us more strength. And I want you to take from the example of Jacob. I don't think he prayed easily. I think he prayed just like his name represents connivingly, what he could get out of God, how he could milk the most out of God. But I really believe that when we struggle with our issues, in that struggle, God gives us the strength. He strengthens us through our struggles in prayer. That I have witnessed for myself. We must look at prayer as the language of friends that can say whatever is in our hearts. See, a lot of other churches teach you must have this tone and you must pray like this, but that's not the way friends and people in close acquaintance speak to each other. That's not the way a husband or a wife or a mother and child or father and child speak. So there, it, it requires, completing the relationship requires conversation. I don't know about you, and, but unless God did not give you the ability to speak, and then in that case, speak with your mind, not your mouth, but if God gave you a mouth, I suggest towards him, use it. Um, finally, I'm going to read something that Chrysostom wrote in about the 370s, and I think it sums it up. The potency of prayer hath subdued the strength of fire. It hath bridled the rage of lions, hushed the anarchy to rest, ex extinguished wars, appeased the elements, expelled demons, burst the chains of death, expanded the gates of heaven, assuaged diseases, repelled frauds, rescued cities from destruction, stayed the sun in its course, and arrested the progress of a thunderbolt. Prayer is an all-sufficient panoply and a treasure that is un diminished. Think of that as a, a key, a, we'll call it a tool that God gave, and think about this as you know that I'm going to pick up next week and probably will continue on the subject of prayer in the New Testament uh, because I really feel that we can glean and understand this. Sometimes you hear everything, I've put out a whole bunch of scriptures and you stand back and you say, okay, there's a whole bunch of scriptures she just read. Go back and reread them with the subject matter in focus. We're looking at prayer. Under what circumstances did the person pray? What was their prayer like? When did God answer? How did God answer? And more importantly than that, after God answered their prayer, I want you to look and see if these people actually went back and gave thanks to God. What was their attitude in response to God making good on their petitions that he finally answered. So all of these things, it's basically like to say, you stop long enough and you analyze some of this, it actually, wait for it, here's the word, concretionizes for us a little bit more what we probably need to be doing more of, and that's more praying with a greater focus, greater clarity, with simplicity that basically says, if we are a people that belong to the Lord, and we are, then we are a praying people. And as I've showed you, at least in a little example today, 
God answers prayer, so the, the, the choice is yours and mine, whether we articulate and speak up to him, whether we speak as one or we speak as a body, whether we intercede for one or in, intercede for a group. We intercede for our country or for the president or for any other person. But that's what we do as Christians. That's not all we do. We are also people of action. But it begins and it's, the action starts with opening up the mouth and speaking to him. You don't need someone in between. Sorry, anybody who still lives in that uh, dark ages of you need, you need an, an intermediary person such as a priest. I'm sorry, but you are not reading this book. If you need a priest to talk to God, then obviously you yourself aren't interested in talking to God and having a relationship with him. And I don't know how you could call yourself a child of God when you yourself never speak to him but it's done through somebody. Does that make sense? Yes, now, you might say, wow, that's pretty brutal and that's pretty harsh, but here's the deal. I'm not here to be pleasant. I'm here to actually wake people up who are living in a stupor of thinking that they can live as Christians like that or survive like that. God gave a recipe or he gave a roadmap. You don't want to follow the roadmap, the problem and the choice is yours. You want to follow the roadmap, I suggest you do what we did today, which is analyze, and you can do it from any book. You can analyze, pick one book, pick the Psalter. For example, th there is replete with petitions and prayers. Try to analyze, and then maybe some of these that are connected to other parts of the Bible. We know that, for example, uh, I believe it's Psalm 78 or Psalm 86. Psalm 78, I think, recaps the history of the children of Israel. Go back then and see when it says that they cried out to the Lord and the Lord heard them and responded. Go back and look exactly how that happened, and you will see that God never once failed to hear or to let it be known that he heard. Now, when it's according to his will and according to his purpose and asked in faith, God is not a man to lie or to say no. So if you and I are earnestly desiring to continue in prayer, then let's do so with the helps from the Bible, not from ideas out there, but directly from this book, how can I learn more and how can I understand better how to have better communication with God? Well, we just took a first look. If you come back next week, we'll take a second. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call one 800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.